and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this evening at our monthly Eye on Asia series. Our guest speaker for tonight has over 20 years of experience in business management, digital transformation and change management, supply chain and project management. He has also worked in consulting, technology, automotive, oil and gas, logistics and transportation industries. Besides holding advisory positions in local enterprises, Marcus has also been supporting China's automotive groups on digital transformation. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Marcus Pang. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, MC. <laughs> okay, um, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, this evening. Um, it's the first time I'm doing this, so just thought to make it a little bit more interactive so that none of us fall asleep. You know, we have a hard day work, so am I. Um, so I'm going to be, be doing this a little bit more interactive. And if you have specific questions, if you want to ask, just raise your hand. And I'm okay to stop halfway. Of course, provided that the other people don't throw stone at you, right? So, um, that's, that's me. Um, I'm actually a vice president for Gartner Advisory now, looking after Southeast Asia business. So what I'm sharing with you was what I had done in the last 22 years when I was uh, based in China. I worked for the consulting firm in China. So over the years, we have done quite a fair bit of related project, uh, especially in the last 10 years, uh, seeing through China's embarkation onto the digital journey. So throughout my years, because we work with a large state-owned company, we've got the, the privilege, if you, if you like that, huh, to work with people like Tangson, because the Chinese government actually make all the large uh, internet company share a lot of their knowledge with the state-owned company in, in the hope to actually bring up the whole economy in a sense. So this is, this is what I will be sharing with you today, a few of the projects that people are doing over the last 10 years. And to let you have a perspective of how the Chinese company are looking at digital transformation. Now, versus what I have found over the six months that I, I'm back in Singapore, you know, so it's kind of like, although I'm a Singaporean, huh, but I'm, I'm coming back with a little bit of culture shock. You know, it's, it's quite different. Now, as early as 2010, that is something like eight years ago, you will find that most of the automotive industry in China started the journey they call CASE. Uh, CASE stands for four types of initiative that they are doing to propel the automotive industry. Now, the first one is actually connectivity. So about 10 years, 10 years, yeah, there about, eight years back, they started looking at putting the car as a connected device. So you start to see the earliest that we had was what we call OnStar, started by General Motors in China. That was the very first one. Uh, at that time, it was actually very simple. They only have a call button for help. You know, but they track you for purpose of safety and all that. Um, and that was as early as that. From then on, you start to roll in things like what? Navigation entertainment, you know, when the Japanese started coming in. So you will find that they started a lot of those features in the very early stage. And actually, as it progresses, now, when they launch anything that has been what we call embedded in the car, they are actually treating the car as a connected unit of the whole ecosystem. All right? so, started off by having, oh, if you want this system, you pay another 1,000 RMB more, for example, till now, there a lot of them are quite willing to say, I give it to you free. Yeah? So they want connectivity. So that was the first uh, concept that was revolutionized in the industry. So it's no longer a feature that you choose, it's a feature that they want to build in. Now, why are they doing this? Now, you imagine the car, it's like your computer or your cell phone. The power of having it connected, 
meaning you can actually have it for many services to be launched to the people who are holding it. So same for the cars that you're driving these days in China. They also want it to be connected. Now, is every one of them doing that? The answer is no. Uh, many of them still struggle with how do I going to recover the cost? Because almost nobody renew that if you ask them to pay. Right? So you can say that, okay, I launch a car, come with a nice little tablet inside with all the features, and say that I'll cover the subscription for two years for you. The third year, you pay. Now, the data that we collected uh, over that period of time is that the renewal rate was extremely low. Why? As far as the consumer is concerned, it's nice to have. You're not going to kill me if, I, if you don't give me that. You know? yeah. So that ended up a challenge if you're trying to sell it as a feature. So those were the early days, and then you see that they actually move on to look at it and say, okay, I don't sell it anymore, let me get it connected. And because of the numbers that they have, I mean, I, I work for those automotive companies in China, and for those of you who are in automotive, you will know, you know, easily one million units of car a year. So easily they have tens of, mil tens, of <laughs> ten yeah, tens of millions of what they call users connected. Now, for those who are familiar with the internet market, is if you tell anyone you've got 20 million connected users, you have a business case of doing something. So this is what they are trying to do. Okay, and given the sheer volume that they have. So that's the first thing that almost all automotive plant is doing now, called connectivity. All right? Now the second word is A, which is the gentleman over there has brought up. It's, it's called autonomous. Now, autonomous vehicle at the moment, it is still on trial, if you like. Uh, for those who are in this industry, you know that they are L1 to L5. Five level of qualification, if you like. Uh, um, none has reached L5 yet. Most of them between L3, they're about plus minus. Huh? Some claim are four, some claim are not. Now, uh, for those who are interested, you can go and read up on the internet. Just Google, they will tell you the difference between the, the mode. Part of the reason also because China is encouraging foreign companies to set up what they call the R&D center. Now, for some of the foreign companies who are not very willing to set up R&D center, what they do? They set up a testing center. Huh? So it, it works either way. So they do the testing there. Now, autonomous vehicle, why is it difficult? Because it is not just the car being able to drive by itself and see things along the way. It is also part that it has to be integrated with the surrounding. Right, you need to know people that are walking nearby. You need to know this and that. Now, so far, what is working is auto parking. Uh, it seems to work pretty well. But other than auto parking, we haven't seen other yet. A lot of them are doing trial on the road in almost every city you can go to. I understand Singapore is trying to launch that. Uh, and personally, I think this is a good place to test. Uh, because we're small, we're well controlled. And LDA, LTA basically single handedly covered everything, right? Which is a lot easier. Try doing it in China. You know, even the big size state owned enterprises would have to muscle through at least, you know, 25 authorities just to get things running. So, so it's a bit harder for them, a lot easier for us. And I, I think the government is very smart that, you know, they want to do that, you know, in Singapore. Uh, so that it's autonomous. Now, what is interesting about autonomous is it actually changes the lifestyle from the way the Chinese automotive company are looking at it. So it's not just a taxi with no one driving. It's more than that. When we were doing a lot of the brainstorming within the Chinese automotive industry, so they start thinking about, I can buy a car with autonomous driving and the car drive to office. I either do facial in my car, or I watch my movie in my car, or I do conference call in my car, or I play games in my car. So it becomes a different platform altogether. 
And what is more interesting is there's no parking issue after that. Because when I reach a shopping centre or a movie theatre that I have, I just say that, okay, I'm going to watch movie for the next, I don't know, how long is the movie these days? Two hours? You know, plus a bit of makan here and there, four hours. Huh? I'm going to be away for four hours. These four hours, this automotive, autonomous automotive, go become an Uber. Work for me for the next four hours, collect some money for me. So you see, it changes how you actually use the car going forward. So the concept, it's then very, very different. So when you look at autonomous, it's more than just having the technology to self-drive. Now, there are other issues, of course. Huh? For those who are in autonomous or artificial intelligence, it's always the issue, the philosophy issue about having too seriously injured or I'm alive but he's dead. But that one, don't ask me because I have no answer. I don't think anyone else have an answer on that. Okay? Um, so that's about autonomous vehicle. The third one, all of you are very familiar with Grab. Uh, and before that, we still have Uber, which has run away before I even come back. So there are many of those in China. Uh, I don't know, thousands. You know, so many of them. Uh, of course, there are big one and small one, regional one, you know, and, and cross-country type. So, so they have those what we call sharing economy. Now, but sharing economy is more than just the Uber or the Grab. They also have things called car to go. Now, some of you actually have tried mobile. OFO, try that. In China, they have it for the cars as well. Huh? I think we also have called Blue something. SG Blue, right? Something like that. <clears throat> yeah, we're trying to do that, okay? So, it was something quite interesting, but not well taken in China because, you know, I, I tried once with uh, car to go and it shows that there is a car two kilometers from me. I said, I'm not going to walk two kilometers there. Nah. It's, it's, it's just too far for me. All right? And when I was in Shanghai, I actually used an EV car similar to car to go or SG Blue for two weeks. And after that, I terminated the service because I hate it. There are a few things that you, you will have a challenge. You check on your APP, you know, the nearby station's got three cars. So, ah, very happy I go there. None of them is there anymore by the time I reach there. Okay, taken away, you know. So, the first challenge is this. Secondly, you go there, oh, the car is there, good. Eh? I refuse to unlock. Then you got to call and call, oh, sorry, our lock is spoiled, you can't do it. Good. You're able to unlock worse, ladies and gentlemen. Because when you're able to unlock, they start counting money. And then you sit inside. The guy refused to move. Uh, so what you have to do, you have to close the door, lock it back, connect it back to the power before they terminate the counting of the money. And I can tell you 99% of the time, the system will check error, error. Error, not connected, not connected. What jialat, I see my money keep running. You know, then you have to call them and terminate them. So those are one problem. Eh? Second one is, of course, the hygiene over there is not too good. Usually when I get into the car, it's like wapiang. And the last one, it's worse, is when you reach your destination, you need to look for a place to park, right? And only designated place. So again, the same problem. You can see it on the display that there are two more parking lots over there. The only challenge is by the time you reach there, it may not be available. So if it's not available, you can't park. If you can't park, you can't return. So what are you going to do? You're going to go around and round and round looking for a place to park. So there was one time that I drive all the way there and I drive all the way back and I take a taxi. <laughs> you know, so there was, there was some of the operational challenges, if you like, when you go about Things like that, car sharing. It's a good concept, but it's not as good as, you know, bicycle, you just throw it there and, and run away. So, when, when we launched that in Singapore, the SG Blue, I have not tried, huh? but I will be curious to find out how they address those issues. Because otherwise, you hate it. You really hate it. Okay? And when I call and complain, 
well, the, the after sales service is actually very nice, you know. Nice little lady voice, very polite. Said, Sir, next time if you're hurry, don't take this car. <laughs> so it's like, okay. You know, I actually take it to work, you know. I purposely choose that hotel because the hotel got this one and I can drive to my so called project place if you like, you know. Ah, okay. Now, peer sharing is another interesting one. Um, this is where um, I think BM, yeah, BM launches it in Europe. Uh, not in China yet when I left. What happened is that uh, one particular car when you bought, you can actually say that my car can be shared within these 10 of my good friends. Yeah, so that 10 of their good friends have the electronic key, can use, and you can even decide how much you want to charge each of them for their usage. So it's like a small little business circle, if you like. All right? uh, 10 of the family to rent a car. Uh, not too sure how well this take off. Uh, apparently, I haven't seen many other people have done it yet. But it's some concept about sharing again. People are taking sharing to the extreme. In China, you share everything. Umbrella also have. You know, rainy days, as, and et cetera, et cetera. So, last one, talk about EV. A few of them are very interested in EV. That Tesla, of course, everybody knows that. Um, but what about EV is, when you actually look at EV, it's not just the battery technology. When you change the car from a diesel car to a, what we call a combustion car, to an EV car, it actually means that there is no mechanical parts in the car. You know, it has not much different compared to a computer, if you like. So you will find that in EV platform, uh, other than all the charging issue and battery issues, the greatest one is how to use it as a software platform. Meaning what? Meaning your car can be upgraded. You know, upgraded to what? A lot of things. Features, uh, performance, etc. etc. So it becomes a lot of possibilities. And this is where uh, EV car is going. So that is one area. The other one about EV is it makes car manufacturing easy. Right? Battery. One iron frame, put four wheels, it runs. Almost like those you're driving the, the golf carts. All right? So, sort of shaken the empire that all the Volkswagen, the Daimler, the BM has it for centuries. You know, now it's like any Tom Dick Harry can build a car. So, we've got hundreds of internet companies in China go into applying, doing EV vehicles. And uh, a lot of them are very, very well designed, you know, like sports cars and all that. Uh, selling well? Not yet. All right. Uh, the reason is this. The hype came up when the policy was supporting buying of EV cars. You'll find that China at one stage really support everybody buying EV cars. You don't need to bid for license. You get subsidies, blah, 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 blah. You know, and when all the hype, everybody jump into it, you take out the subsidies anymore. No more from this year onward. So everybody jalat lah. So once they take out that subsidies, the next thing that gone away is what? Hot funds. So all the, all the, all the investment company, then they're not sure about China direction, they also pull back. Then you'll find that both are actually not moving now. So currently, a lot of the EVs are struggling, if you like. Uh, but there are some of them with good backings. I will show you some of this uh, as we move on. So, these three brands are relatively interesting because they are backed by different people, right? Uh, this brand backed by Tengsen, this brand backed by Baidu, this brand backed by Alibaba. Now, what was actually interesting is that these three brands, uh, initially when they came out, because I service the traditional OEM, so they asked me, Marcus, how are all these new boys coming up? Is it going to affect us? So I say, as long as they are selling cars, you don't have to worry. Because no one knows how to sell car more than you. Right? You, you handled it hundreds of years already. You know how to deal with your supplier. You know how to deal with your, your, your dealers. They don't. Huh? 
uh, I don't know how many of you understand Hokkien here. Jiao Kian Plastic. That's what we are saying. Okay? Because they will run into problem when they're trying to scale. You know, because they will find the supplier is not supporting them. They will find the dealer is not doing the things that they're supposed to do. Things like that. So, they actually happen. But what was interesting is because of the backing of all these few guys, they have a little bit more money. And they started to try different way of selling the car. Or that gets the big company worries. Um, Tencent, for example, um, they also have an investor there who is actually from Xiaomi. How many of you actually use the handphone Xiaomi? Mi handphone. Not many, huh? Good. <laughs> no, but, but I don't know how many of you actually look at their business model. Xiaomi's business model, it's one of those what we call fans economy. They develop die-hard fans. The die-hard fans help them to research, test, use, improve the product. Now, this brand is doing the same now. So their first launch last year, I think, was 10,000 cars only to the 10,000 fans that they have who actually designed the car together, say what colour, whether the backside should be round or square, get tested, and they are the 10 of them that get the car. Now, it's more than just that. After these 10,000 people got the car, all the services were provided. Meaning what? If you need a charging station because it's an EV car, they provide arrangement to make charging station at your parking space. Now, you have to understand that in China, Getting that done by itself is not easy. Okay, because in China, everything is possible, nothing is easy. It doesn't look so straightforward. So, that is a hustle. And then, all the servicing, it's all done for you. Now, it's almost like a premium package, if you like. So, when the traditional OEM asked me, Marcus, do you think that will work? So, I said, I don't know. You know, because I'm not a fortune teller. Huh? But I say what you should be worried is, if it works, you need at least three years to adopt that model. Can you lose three years of market? Now, that's my question to him. So that, it's actually a lot more important because they are selling it in a totally different model. Now here I give you a bit of a background because traditionally, automotive company, they don't sell car. They produce the car, and it's the dealer that's selling it to all their means and ways. So the OEM itself doesn't really care now. So if you imagine you want the OEM to start creating a group of diehard fans, help them with the R&D, help them with the testing, help them with the first run of the car, they don't even know which department to go to. Okay, so, so issues are a lot more serious at hand then. Okay, and then for sharing, of course, you know, there are lots of all these brands in there, and all of them are humongously big. Um, and I think our Grab is trying to do as much as, as them as well. <coughs> now, so where are we? So when we talk about digitization of the automotive industry, you will find that they are looking at not just the technology. They are actually looking at the whole life cycle of the buying process up to usage. So the first thing that they do, I apologize, it's all in Chinese because I, I just take the standard slides off them, okay? This whole axis here is actually from awareness, selection, experience, buy, use, and repurchase. So you find that they mapped out the entire customer journey and they actually look at how many of these faces are moving from offline to online. Yeah? So, identifying which are the phases that has to be done so-called digitally. So, they actually make that study and try to engage their customer in the digital space. Now, this is the first attempt that some of them are doing, reaching out to the end user. It's a big step for the OEM. Because for those in the automotive should know, 
most of the time, the OEM doesn't care. All right? So this is one thing that they do. The other thing that they do is actually for usage of the car. Um, you will know that as a driver, you have many use of your car. So they actually also go through the whole thing. It's like, uh, typically you need to find your car because in a big parking complex, you always cannot find your car. So how do you help the guy to find the car? And then you need to drive and use the car. You need to find parking for the car. You need to charge if you are EV. You need to do servicing. And you need someone to handle when there's an incident. So these are typically the journey that you go through as a driver. So they look at this and say that, OK, how can I address all this? Either digitally or through support of partners. So this is how they are mapping out the whole uh, life cycle, if you like. So some example, they started mapping up what we call customer persona to know what you need, what you want, you know, and they even predict, given certain situation, you are likely to come back to buy the second car. You know, so they started doing things like this a few years back, what they call um, the big data analytics. And when they look at e-commerce, uh, we also talk about e-commerce, trying to sell the car online, they are not just selling the car. You will see that they actually look into the whole life cycle. They're actually trying to put themselves to be leader in the digital business. And they also look at how to collaborate internally and externally by grouping all of their services together. So they look at new sales model, new usage service, and extended ecosystem. So there's a more investment that go in into this platform. This platform, what it does is it sells cars on the platform. Uh, it service car. It takes good care of the user. It educates the user on automotive knowledge, etc., etc., etc. So it is managed by a team of, I think, 600 people, something like that. So it's a humongous investment, not just setting up an e-commerce platform. It is actually an entire business of marketing and selling cars online. When they set up this, their first point is to really to connect the users. In the early days, they do not get in touch with the users. The dealers are the ones with the users. That means when you buy a car, you buy from the dealers. The dealer keeps your information. When you do servicing, it's the dealer who is servicing you. So the OEM is trying to now say that I want to reach out to my users. So connectivity is what they want to do. So you will find that they start rolling out a lot of features on the platform, uh, being it promotion, uh, educational events, servicing package, etc., etc., trying to deal direct with the users. All right? And of course, if you want to buy a car, they give discount, special model. You know? And what they do is when you decided to buy, they route it to the dealers, still make the dealers happy. Now, so what are they doing all this? They are trying to connect to their users. Now, if you ask me, why do they want to get connected? Well, this is where the internet world is going. When you get connected to, let's say, 20 million users, you have a business case of doing many things, which is quite true in this particular case, because once they get connected, they've got big data. Once they've got big data, they start analyzing. They know what their users want. And then they start creating what we call a totally new value chain of picks, if you like, you know, a new partners, if you like, along the value chain to service these 20 million users. And when you have that, you have a new business model coming up. Now, it is a venture that they decide to take. When they first started, they have no idea where they will land. So I must say that among all the automotive companies, this guy is state-owned now, by the way, but it's owned by Shanghai government. It's really bold in taking that step a lot earlier than many of our Western brands. You know, so, so they really take the step out. And it's a long journey. It's a long journey. And they made a lot of mistakes along the way. But like what the CEO said, you know, today nobody knows digital automotive more than them because they literally do it. Uh, so when they did it six years, eight years back, if you look at it now, 
it's really to preempt the disruption coming to the industry. In the automotive industry, they were most worried about initially Uber. You know, and it's going to take over the industry. Then, of course, then they start to worry when Alibaba also trying to sell car. Oh, they also jealous. Then they also have the what they call the vertical uh, websites, if you like, huh? who is Pacific Automotive in, in China. It's a bit like our SG Moto. Huh? If you are OEM, you get worried huh? because SG Moto tells you what brand is good, what brand is not good. You know, you, you get worried. So they also want to dominate that. At least there is a different views that you can see from the OEM. So, so this is why they started the whole process. Uh, unfortunately, like what you have questioned, huh? financially it don't make sense. But anyway, none of the internet company financially makes sense. You know? But hang, hang, uh, one of them win, they disrupt the whole industry. And this is the problem that we are facing today. Okay? Okay, let me move on. Usage of the car, okay, has, has also evolved. Uh, for example, when we use a car, I don't know whether you like it or not, I, I hate the most part is I have to send a car for service. I wait out there for the service and then come back. Now in China, it's even worse. Huh? I have to drive something like uh, probably 40, 45 minutes to get to outskirt, you know, where I find a store. And then I probably got to spend half a day there. Because, uh, of course, they, they give you a very nice lunch. Food, you know, and all that, eat and drinks and watch TV and all that. But half a day, and then I'm going to drive all the way back. So what they're offering now is, on top of notifying you time for servicing, they will say, Mr. Pang, are you okay that we come and pick the car tomorrow afternoon? They take the car, they drive for the servicing, they drive it all the way back. In between, they tell you which other part that has been changed, and then you pay online. And this is what is happening, even in the after sales. I ask for that when I come back to Singapore. Anyway, now, uh, the other hot topic that most of the OEMs are doing, because they're manufacturing, they started to jump on the bandwagon of Industrial 4.0. Everybody wants to do that. Yeah? Um, so we had one company that we started this in 2000 and, let me see. 2014, 2015, which is three years back. <clears throat> and um, eventually, they only landed doing what we call automation and big data for analytics. They didn't really get to where 4.0 wants them to go. Uh, mainly because, I don't know how many of you know Industrial 4.0. Heard of this thing? Huh? Okay, who hasn't heard of it? Anyone don't know what is Industrial 4.0? Okay. <clears throat> i just easily, uh, simply explain it a bit. Um, this is the fourth revolution of the industry in terms of manufacturing. Now, why is it called the fourth? It's because uh, the very first one was when steam engine was done. You'll find that a lot of the machinery work can be done, right? And then the second phase come when you have electricity. Then you can start to do a lot of the lot more, a lot more stuff in manufacturing. And then the third phase came when what we have, what you see today, what we call the pipeline manufacturing, with all the computers, the automations, and all that, is what we have today called mass manufacturing. Now, what they are proposing, in fact, it was proposed by Germany initially, was that if we can put the computer brain into all the machinery and let the machine be smart enough to decide what I should do now, what I should do next, what I should do after that, and who should I do it on. And then let the product be smart enough to know that, okay, I'm a car, I'm to be sold to Singapore, to, uh, what's your name again? Ah, sold to Lee. So Lee wanted a red car, for example. So this car will say that, okay, I haven't got painted yet. I should go to that station to paint myself red. I should then go to that place to pick up sports rim, for example, because you want sports rim. The product itself knows what to do. So if they start imagining the whole factory, instead of a structured programming, the factory become alive. How many of you watched... Uh, 
the night at museum. Huh? Something like that. You know, where all your machines are able to talk to each other and all the cars are able to go to the workstation that they want and whichever workstation that's available, they go in and get something fixed. So, that was the idea. And the idea to do that is because they believe in future, you need to make product of one and yet still make money. Today, we're talking about mass manufacturing, right? Every car is the same. You want a red car, you think it's very nice. Huh? You drive on the road, you see the other 100. Uh, but they're talking about in future, you should have your own design. But yet, you know, when you're in manufacturing, you know that if you do only one jalat, huh, your cost will be so high. So how do we do that and yet can make money? And that's what 4.0 is supposed to address as part of this, uh, its principle. Now, there are a lot of them, when they started doing this, they find that there's no market for one. Not yet. So none of the market is ready for what we call market of one. So therefore, they only said, that, okay, then we only do the part on automation, uh, which is what they have been doing for the last umpty years, but now got new technology. You can start to integrate a little bit more things in there. So, so this is what happened. In China, most of them started with Industrial 4.0, eventually landed up with a lot of what we call enhanced computerization and enhanced automation. So that's essentially the, the status that they are now. China has been the world manufacturing base because of a couple of reasons, right? One, they've got a lot of people. Two, they've got a lot of land. Although it's getting more and more expensive. Huh? But once you adopt Industrial 4.0, in theory, huh, Singapore can produce as many as them. Because in Industrial 4.0, I don't need that much space. I don't need human being, if you like. Okay, there are uh, white papers on the internet, you can go and search for it, that is published by the Germany government, talks about Industrial 4.0 and the different program that they have trying to launch it. Um, you will find that space and labour is no longer a prerequisite for manufacturing. And I think Singapore, if you look at the Future Economy Committee, something like that, uh, they publish a paper, and one of the areas is go into smart manufacturing. Okay, so they're also picking up this. Uh, although I haven't seen much things being done yet, but I think this is one direction that they are moving to. FinTech also being adopted into manufacturing. Now this one, we will need everyone to understand a little bit what, what it's doing. Um, You've been a supplier, is it? Or oh, you're the OEM? You're OEM. Supplier also, huh? Okay. So, as in all supplier, they have a bitter life from the beginning, right? Because the OEM would expect you to supply and supply and supply <laughs> and they pay you very late, right? I don't know why they want to do that, but they, they seem to enjoy doing that. Uh, because they're, they're not short of money. Because on the other hand, they are asking the dealer to put cash and take the car. So they actually collect cash and delay payment. Okay, so this is what OEM do anyway. They do it for a habit. You know, they sort of enjoy that for the 100 years. So, so what happened is that in China, they start to, start to worry about this. And because um, unlike the mature market where the, the suppliers are relatively muscular, huh? and established people like Bosch, you know, Siemens, and all that. In China, you have a lot of kuching kura one. You know, small, tiny kacang putih supplier. Huh? You go and hold his payment for two more months only. You, next day, you go to his shop, huh? kaput liao. Nobody there. So what, what happened? What happened is that your whole supply chain become problem. Because OEM automotive, they have a stringent quality to qualify a supplier. So you skin him and squeeze him and squeeze him and when he's dead, huh, it takes you some time to find someone else. So the procurement department become very happy because they achieve all their KPIs, you know, but the other departments started screaming. So they have all this issue. Then they talk about the stability of supply chain. So what they do? They say, okay, we do this. We take account payable information 
from OEM. Account payable, I mean, it's still in the system. Account payable means, okay, I admit I owe you money. But I can admit that for 10 years, for example. So I admit that I owe you money. Then I take that as a credit note. Right? And I go to the bank. The bank will lend me money to do whatever I want to do. And then when you pay me, I will pay the bank. So that's what a credit note is about. Now, they are doing this a little bit better because, um, first of all, the, the account payable information is shared on a platform. They call it a fintech platform. And then the financial institute, whether it is a bank or it is a loan shark company or whatever, see the information, they will take the money and they will lend it to the supplier of the parts. Of course, with a discount, maybe 80% or 50%, depends on the risk appetite. So when the OEM come to the time to pay, the money actually goes to the platform first, where the bank will sapu first. The remaining, they will give it to the supplier. So the loan is being repaid first. So in this particular case, the supplier is happy because he's able to borrow money from a cheaper source, typically the proper financial institute. So instead of going to the along and paying you know, 34%, they just go to proper bank, which is quite happy to charge them between 15 to 18%. The bank choke up bank now. You know, they're very happy to do that. Some are guaranteed by OEM. Right? So the OEM has got a sec secure supply chain. The bank is making all the interest of the money. The supplier get to borrow money and the bank split a little bit of profit to the OEM. It's a tripartite win. You know, a very interesting business case. Any question? You want me to explain a little bit on the fintech? You know, you don't see anything on the fintech inside, right? Okay, first of all, this thing requires a platform to support the integration with all the systems that's in the OEM. And it has to have all the integration gateway to the banks for the payment and collection. So it is operated by a lot of the fintech technology company that has the solution to the different banks gateway. That's what they are doing. They call themselves fintech company. Maybe not by definition technology-wise fintech, but they are solving a financial challenges here. So that's the definition of it. It didn't really take off very well. There are some adaptation, um, but it didn't work so well. Now, this, this whole concept, ladies and gentlemen, works on one thing. It works on the credibility of the OEM to pay on time. That doesn't happen in real world. You know? I mean, you, you will probably won't. <laughs> you know? They say, yes, account payable, I owe you. Huh? I'm supposed to pay in 60 days. Yes, I admit that. 600 days later, yes, I still admit that. You know, but I'm not going to pay you still. So this is the challenge. Then they can't do that. OEM didn't want to do this. It's forcing them to pay on time. And they never want to pay on time. Beats me why, eh? but this is what it is. Then you'll find that when we do digital strategy, the few examples that I show you that they do in China, a lot of them revolve around what they call the, the new business model or the new revenue or products with better customer experience. Those, those are the areas that they actually focus a lot more. So we must remember is we, we got into today's stage where everybody is spending money on digitization because of the disruption that is caused by all these alien companies initially. They come up with very interesting business model. They suddenly swap the world. So as OEM or traditional business, you got worried because you don't want to be the Nokia. You don't want to be the Kodak. So what you do? You started investing money to explore all these new tools or toys. Now, the challenge is this. As we got into this, 
we suddenly find that we deviate from the original reason, we dive into exploring technology. We have forgotten that we are actually trying to explore new business model. Because it is the new business model is going to kill you. You know, someone mastering the technology may have an edge, but it won't kill you. Someone will come up with a new business model, it's likely to swipe you. You know, so this is this is where I like all of you to when you do your digitization strategy and all that. Think a little bit on that. You know? So of course, then you look back to your own industry that you are in. In some of these industries, you will find that there is a huge competitor out there that is you know, uh, disrupting the whole industry. In some other industry, there aren't any yet. They are small ones trying out new things. You know, insurance, for example, trying out new things. You know, the biggest one that you can see now, banking, for example. Banking almost get washed away by all the online payment, but they very hang lah. They got saved by regulation. The government protected them. Otherwise, there's no need for banks anymore. You know, mobile payment works well. We we'll talk about mobile payment. Another thing I want to complain. You know, we we have um, we have uh, Alipay and WeChat payment in China, right? I think most of you are aware of that. For those people who have gone China, if you don't have this account, forget about going there because if you take out cash, they look down at you. Very like that. Okay. Now. It has adopted very well everywhere, with their reasons, of course. Now, when I was in China, working with them when they launched WeChat Pay, I tell you, this is what they do. You're a merchant, ah. Eh? Hey, use, free, ah. Uh, you do POS with a bank, right? Point of sales with a the bank, they do one month transaction. Ah. Seven days, seven days I give you money. Cash. Oh, the merchant very happy. Do you know what the merchant do? They will tell consumer like us, Hey, don't use credit card. Lah. Don't want, don't want, don't want. You got WeChat now. Why? Because they got seven days payment. Man. Then I use WeChat consumer. When we start off, we got about five cent discount, something like that. Lah. A little bit. Lah. But still good to have. So I can over just a period of few years, everywhere is adopted. Today you, you go there, Alipay or WeChat, lah. even the beggar, lah. <laughs> they give you the QR code, you know. Serious, I'm not joking. They give you QR code. If you tell him, you got no small cash. They give you QR code. They collect that on QR code also. So it's like, we, 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 are, not, we are unfortunately not doing that. I don't know why. You know, it's, it's, it's such a simple concept. Again, back to whose question? Ah, your question was that. When WeChat do that, he wanted connectivity. So when you have 50 million users on it, can you imagine the amount of cash flow? That he had on his platform and seven days with a merchant, right? The banks uh, will go and kneel down and say, please put money in my bank. You know, and they will bid for who got highest interest. Example. So again, when we launch digital transformation project, we have to always think, why are you doing it? You know, versus ah, I got a new toy, I want to sell and make money. All right. Now, why is it so difficult to sell this concept back into company? Because your board of director need to revolve around cost and productivity. Everything we do is cost and productivity. We have had this for the last, I don't know, how many centuries? Yeah. So, how to make them say that, okay, how much of your effort what to put into what we call customer experience and new value chain. Now, what is customer experience? Customer experience is connectivity. Because the experience is good, I want to stay with you. I want to continue spending within your system. It's called connecting. I'm keeping hook onto you. So, the other one is ecosystem. Why you need a new ecosystem? Because it's a new value chain. With a new value chain, then you can find picks. Anybody know why we need to find pigs? Oh, very quietly. Okay. 
The Chinese had a standard saying called Yang Mao Chu Zai Yang Shen Shang, meaning if, if you want to buy a product from me and you ask for a lot of quality, you pay more. So the transaction is between two of us, right? And then this Jack Ma, after, uh, ever since his success in Alibaba, he came up with a term, Yang Mao Chu Zai Zhu Shen Shang, meaning what? The two of us can do business, but the profit margin is contributed by someone else. So who is this someone else? Then you have to find it in the new ecosystem. That means to say what? When I have 50 million users who is willing to stick to my platform because of good customer experience, there ought to be someone out there who is willing to pay me to be part of the ecosystem. Right? This is what they are doing. So back to the, the other gentleman at the back there who asked about uh, the, the Taobao and the Timor. Huh? It's like when you buy and sell, it's actually $1 is to $1. So where did Taobao or Timor make the money? It's because of the money transaction go through Alipay. Seven days, huh? You know the amount of money they actually transacted? It's humongous. They're bigger than any banks. You know, so that is why he said, Pigs is giving me the money. So this is another concept that you need to sell to your board. Uh, if you're talking to the board. So, okay. so again, uh, a picture that I always use to talk to a lot of my customers. You know, when you're trying to do digital transformation, you know, so it's a new market with new rules. Don't judge with the old values. If not, we will never move. All right? So this is, again, I see more of this in the China attempt, maybe because the market is bigger. You know, and people look for more strategic things. And because it's also chaotic, there's always an easy way to make that move and win some market. In Singapore, you can try and then you find that cannot do this, cannot do that, the rule says cannot do this, the rule says can only do that, and you know, things like that. Okay, uh, this is the last part. Okay, uh, Some lessons learned. So, again, when you do digital transformation, please remember why you are doing this. Okay, it's the disruption that's pushing you, not the technology. So look at the way the Chinese OEM do it. They really launch to, to really try to overturn the market or come up with new services. They're not launching it because they want to try AI technology. You know, that's not part of their concern. All right? And always have a clarity of vision and get alignment within your department. Because you will find that, uh, you know, every time when I go and talk to talk to one of the department, they will come to me and say, hey, Marcus, we want to do digital transformation. I say, very good. You want to transform? Very good. So what happened to your neighbours? You know, your upstream department, your downstream department. You cannot just transform by yourself. What? You transform already, they all how? So at the end, should we get one? Huh? So this is, again, something that you need to look into. Uh, it is definitely not an IT project. Now, this is the first thing that I do when I get into a company and they say they want to do digital transformation because 90% of the time, the budget comes from IT department. So what I will do is I will try to sweet talk the CIO to say that, take out your money, let's form a committee with the ops, with the strategy, with the whoever department and share the money. Otherwise, nothing gets moved, I can tell you. All right. So this is, again, it's not an IT job, it's a business change. So get in the other people if you want it to move. Huh? And then don't judge using old mindset, I will just talk about it. And this is also another thing that people actually forgot. So when they started the e-commerce platform, they started with an idea of continuous operation. It's not like the old days when we said, oh, we go live. Well, in Britain, too loud. No, it doesn't work that way. Eh? Because you need to continuously improve it. Why? Because the purpose is make sure that 20 million users stick on to you. Uh, if you don't entice them, they go away next day. Hey, this day, no royalty one. Eh? Whichever place cheap or good will go, you know. So this is important. Eh? Now, the other thing is don't start separate lab. You know, a lot of companies said, hey, we want to start digital transformation. We know that it's difficult because we are very traditional. So let's create a company next door and let them do it. And then you'll find that they're a very good idea. But everything that they do is on your business, right? 
So they need to work with your product, work with the different departments, work with your dealers, and then your corporate governance and compliance start coming in. How to work? It can never work. So having a bimodal is very important, meaning the traditional part has to be changed or managed to work with them. We call bimodal. This is also you know, a lot of the research area going to this as well. Uh, the last one is, of course, don't work alone. You know, a lot of big companies, when they're trying to do transformation, they believe they can do everything. Now, there's a very famous case study, which is uh, GE, yeah, who started the whole transformation very early. And of course, if you go into the Google News sound, you find that they are the one that is really losing a lot of money and then trying to sell off everything here and there. Now, they got a bit too ambitious. All right? So when you start on this, you must understand it is a new game, a new area. So work with partners, work with partners. On one hand, get new thoughts. On the other hand, trying to change your people. You know, a lot of company runs hackathon with those internet company, TBS, I believe, is one of them. I spoke with David before, you know. So, so those are the things that you do, partly because of bimodal, partly because, uh, gentlemen, ladies, you remember the pigs? The pigs come from all these partners that you're going to work with. Find the pigs among them. You know, when you are able to entice 20 million users, you will see who is the pigs to be skinned. All right? So that, that, those are the few things that I think we've learned over the years. So I, I thought just to share that with you. Okay. Thank you so much um, to Marcus. Can we give Marcus a round of applause for taking the time to be here tonight? and to share his knowledge and experience and insights on China's automotive industry.